So um, I remember I was sharing um, my testimony um, with a sermon over the summer in Wisconsin, and I was sharing it, and I was getting into it, and I, I started going off on something, a little sidetrack, but I, I was really preaching, and out of nowhere, I just forgot where I was. I just went blank, and I was like, oh, no. I stood there for a minute. I was like, I forgot where I was at, and then I remembered. So pray that doesn't happen tonight. Pray that I can remember everything that I want to say and that the Lord um, can use me and speak to us, okay? So let's, um, let's pray real quick. Father, I want to um, thank you so much, Lord, um, for the opportunity to share. And Lord, I just want to pray that you would give me your Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray that we could just hear a message from heaven, Lord. Um, Father, you know my mind, I have all different things I always want to say, Lord. But Father, I know that my words don't have power, Lord, but your words do. So Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be here. I pray for your angels to be here, to touch our hearts and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So as I have thought about and contemplated like this plan of salvation and the plan of redemption, and as I've looked at the path that God has taken me in my own life, and as I, I look at other people's story, and as I hear other people's story about salvation, I've noticed a, a pattern of events that take place. And I read it in the Bible, too. I read all these different stories, and I see the same pattern take place. And when I examine my own life, I look back on my life as I saw the steps that it took to come to Jesus, and as I see the steps that it takes for other people to come to Jesus, the first thing that I noticed, the first thing that I needed, and that we all need, is that we have to see a need. Like, not just, not just a, a casual need of Jesus, but like seeing our utter helplessness, like our complete dependence, that we are completely powerless without Jesus, powerless over sin, powerless over temptation, powerless in our lives. So I've seen the first thing that was needed is to have a need, realize a need for Jesus. And when we see that we have a need for Jesus, it leads us to do something else. And that is cry out to him. Seeing our utter helplessness, seeing that we need Jesus, it leads us to cry out to Jesus. And he hears us. He hears us when we cry out to him when we see that we are helpless in our own condition and we cry out to Jesus. And the next thing I realized in my own life as I traced this pattern in my own life and through Bible stories and other people is that as we do that, as we cry out to Jesus, as we see our need, that through the help of God, our eyes start being taken away from ourselves, from our helpless condition, and the Lord helps us direct our eyes to Jesus. So as we take our eyes off ourselves and our eyes get directed to Jesus, as we come closer to Jesus, as we come closer into his presence, something takes place. Like something powerful takes place in our lives. Like a freedom, like life really happens then. And as I notice this pattern of seeing our need, of crying out to Jesus, of taking our eyes off of our helpless, apparently hopeless condition and fixing it on Jesus, Drawing into his presence, something beautiful takes place, friends. Don't we want to, we want to experience that, right? Yes. We want to have this experience with Jesus. And I found a story in the Bible, friends, that is so beautiful. And it illustrates this exact step-by-step -step process of salvation, of seeing your need, seeing your helpless condition, crying out to Jesus, taking your eyes off yourself, because yourself can't do you any good, and fixing it upon Jesus and something beautiful happened. And so I want us to look at this story tonight. It's found in Mark chapter 5. If you've ever been in my canvassing programs, then you know this is probably my favorite story in the whole Bible. It's so beautiful. It's a story of power. And you know, I've learned something else, that as I read the Bible stories, and I don't just read it as a story, but I put myself in the position of the person we're reading about, you know, it makes the book come alive. Like, you can see your own life, your own condition in the Bible. That's powerful if you really think about that. You know, no other book can do that, where you can read the story of your own life right here in the Bible. So as we go to Mark chapter 5, 
We're going to read the story about the demon-possessed man. And I want us to notice the steps that this man took, the steps that it took for him to come to Jesus. And I want you to get personal with this story. Let's not just read, let's not just read the story, but let's get personal. Put yourself in this position. And you can see yourself, even though this is an extreme case. This is the condition. This is the step-by-step process that every person that will ever go to heaven is going to go through. Every one of us. It doesn't have to be as extreme as this, but we're all going to go through it. And praise God that we get to go through it. And so Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, And they come over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gardarians, And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. You know, what a sight. What a sight this is to see this man that nothing could hold him down, like had this supernatural strength. And although he wasn't able to be held by shackles and chains, you can tell this man was bound and shackled by sin and in the tomb of his own mind. This man was bound by sin. And you know what's amazing? When you read this story, it's amazing to see what sin can do, where sin can lead you. Because the truth is, friends, I believe this is a story of a very normal man, a normal person at one point in time, but through choices, through choosing not God, choosing sin, one step after another, until his mind was gone, and he was truly shackled and bound in the tomb of his own mind, shackled by sin, by choices. And you know the reason I say that I believe this was a normal person at one point in time, just like me and you, But through choosing not God, through choosing the world, choosing the pleasures of this world, his mind was taken captive. You know, not choosing God is actually very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Because, you know, God has given us free will. But friends, this is the truth. Free will can be very deceiving, friends. Because the truth is, in this life, you only have power to make one choice. One choice. Every other choice you will ever make in your life is controlled by a power that's greater than you. Do you know what that choice is? Who will you serve? You can either choose to serve God or you choose not to serve God. If you choose to serve God, then God will work in us to will and do his good pleasure. But if we choose not to serve God, there is another spirit and another power that controls us and controls our actions. Why I say that I believe this is a normal person is because I want to tell you a story real quick about a man named Denny Craig. Denny Craig had um, probably the most lasting impression of my life. I'll never forget him, ever for the rest of my life. I met Denny Craig about five years ago. Um, I, I was living in a group community housing situation. It was jail. But jail doesn't really sound very good at the pulpit. So I was in a community group housing situation. And as I was living in this community housing situation, um, there was a man in there, a long-haired hippie named Denny. And I used to watch Denny. He just seemed like a normal guy. And I really never paid him no mind, paid him no attention. And... One day, I sat down at, at lunch to have my lunch, and old man Denny, long-haired hippie, came and sat across from me. And, you know, I wasn't thinking nothing about it. He just sat down, and he had his food, and he started a conversation with me. But something caught my ear. As he, as he started talking, I started realizing that his words were not making any sense, like no sense. So I looked at him, and he was just talking away. And I mean, I mean nonsense, friends. I mean, like, he was just taking words and putting them together. 
no structure at all. And I was like, oh, what is this? So I just started watching him. I was like, this is really interesting. And as I was watching Denny, you know, it's kind of sad because I'm, I'm kind of making a joke about it. But whenever he looked in my eyes and I looked in Denny's eyes, he, he looked dead in my eyes. And he started talking gibberish. And I seen that nobody was home. There was nobody there. Like this man was gone. And I like felt really bad. I was like, man, what do I do for this guy? Like this man was just gone. I started watching Denny. This man would stay up all night for days. No sleep. Walking back and forth. Carrying on insane conversations. It's the conversations that didn't make any sense. And he would do obscene things, things that I'm not going to tell you about. One night I was watching Denny, and I was noticing he started talking, but he started making sense. He, it was, he was talking to somebody that wasn't there. And then it was like somebody was talking back to him. And I was just watching. I was like, Lord, this man is demon-possessed. Like, this was, this was real life demon possession. This man, I, at that time, that night, this man was talking to somebody. And somebody was talking to him. And it was really, really creepy. And you know what? I learned the story behind Denny. One of Denny's old school buddies came and joined our community housing situation there. And, um, and he started telling me about Denny one day. Denny was an old cowboy, normal person, had a ranch, had a job. I don't remember if he said he had a family. Denny was a normal person. But Denny was a drug addict. Denny, from a young age, had chosen not God, made his choice of sin, made his choice of walking in darkness, made his choice of drugs and the sins and the death and the things of this world, ultimately choosing not God, choosing drugs, choosing everything but life, choosing only the ways of the world. And one night, Denny did so much methamphetamine that his mind was completely taken captive, completely taken captive by the devil. He made a choice. That's such a sad story. But I believe that's the same story that this man right here was going through. I believe he was normal at some point in time. But he was always looking to himself. He was always making his own decisions. He didn't want to consult God. He wanted to look to himself, make his own decisions in life, Decide where he's going to go, decide what he's going to do until that power, that spirit that he didn't understand, that spirit that was leading him and controlling him like a puppet, that spirit that was leading him and making him think he was making his own decisions, but he wasn't, friends. There was something else controlling this man until his mind was taken captive and he was lost in darkness and bound in the portals of his own mind and chained and shackled by iniquity. What a sad story. But praise God that he wasn't left that situation. And praise God that my friend Denny didn't have to be left that situation. Because look at what the story says here. In, in verse 5. In verse 5. It says, And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, Crying and cutting himself with stones. You know, I can't help but believe that this man was crying out for help. I can't help but believe, friends, as I read this story and I see that he was crying and cutting himself with stones. I can't help but believe that he was crying out for help. That he finally saw his condition. That he saw where sin had led him. Saw where the life of this world would lead him. And I believe his heart was crying out to Jesus, crying out for help. You know, I believe that this man had so long looked to himself. I believe that's why he's cutting himself. You know, he was so used to looking to himself. And now when he looked to himself and saw where himself had got himself, to saw where he had, his own choices had led him, I believe that when he looked to himself now, he would cut himself, hating his own flesh, hating himself. 
And he was crying out for help. You know, and I'm sure, friends, that all the people that were around this area, all the neighbors and all the people that were hearing his cries, I'm sure that they didn't hear the cries of somebody pleading for help. I'm sure what they heard was the blood-curdling screams of a man that was demon-possessed. But praise God that if our heart is crying out for help, God hears us. And God wants to deliver us. God wants to set us free. Just like he did for this. Just like this man right here wanted to be set free. He did. He was longing for freedom from sin. He, was, he needed it. He wanted it. He was crying and pleading out to God for help. Tired of looking to himself. Wanting to look to something more. Look at what the next verse says right here. In verse 6. It says, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. This is so powerful. I want you to think about it. I want you to look at this real quick, friends. Look at this. It says that he had been looking to himself. I believe this is what it's saying. All his life, looking to himself, making his own choices. Now he was tired of looking to himself. I believe this is what verse 6 is saying, friends. It says, but when he took his eyes off himself, when he decided that his self could not save him, when he decided that he could not look to himself, what did he do? He looked to Jesus when he took his eyes off himself and he laid his eyes on Jesus when he first saw his condition, his helpless, helpless, hope, apparently hopeless condition. He cried out to Jesus took his eyes off himself and fixed him upon Jesus. And then something happened. Do y'all see that right there? Do y'all see what I'm saying? And look at what happened. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. You know, I believe this was the same thing that was happening when he was crying in the tombs, that those around him wasn't hearing the cries of somebody for help. But this man, when he ran to Jesus, he ran and his heart was crying out to Jesus for help. But the demons began to speak through him. And it says in verse 8, For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh into the mountain a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And look at verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. You know, whenever this man had come to Jesus... Whenever he took his eyes off himself, laid his eyes upon Jesus, he experienced something in his life. He experienced a cleansing. He experienced something that nobody could deny. Like he experienced something that was evident to all those around him. It was something that could not be denied. You know, we have this relation. When we have this experience with Jesus, you know, something happens. Something happens in our life that is evident to all that nobody can deny. You know, there's something powerful about a personal testimony. You know? You know why? Because nobody can argue with that. Nobody can argue with a personal testimony. And you know, this same power that this man found right here in Jesus, by taking his eyes off himself and looking unto Jesus, is still available today. That power is still available today. You know, this is why it says in the book Prayer, page 12, That prayer brings us into immediate contact 
with the wellsprings of life. You know, we don't have Jesus here personally. We can see him and run to him, but we can run to him on our knees and cry out to him for help, plead with him for help, take our eyes off ourselves, and we can experience the same thing that this man experienced, a freedom, a freedom that's evidence to all, that nobody, nobody could deny, that nobody could argue with. Man, don't you want that? That true freedom that only Jesus can offer, friends. Let's finish reading the story. And they that saw that, saw it, told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was coming to the ship, he, had, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them, how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish it, in Deca- began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men marveled. You know, everybody that those men came into contact with, what 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 they do? They marveled. Why? Because he was sharing his testimony, wasn't he? about how Jesus had transformed him. They could see that something had happened. And Jesus said, go home and tell them what I've done for you. A, t- a personal testimony that God has given each one of us, friends, is the most powerful thing that you, you, you have. It's, it's the greatest witness that you have for the truth, friends, is your own personal testimony. And everybody has a testimony. Anybody that's come into the presence of Jesus that's cried out to him, took his eyes off himself, laid his eyes upon Jesus, come into his presence, and experience his freedom, friends. That's the most powerful testimony that you could ever have. You don't have to be an ex-drug addict. You don't have to be an ex-criminal. You can be an ex-Laodicean. It doesn't matter what, what, it, what it is. When you are lost and bound by sin, and Jesus touches you and sets you free, what, what more could you want? What, what more of a testimony could you want? Man, don't you want to experience that and go tell people about what Jesus has done? Man, that's all I want to do, friends, is tell people what Jesus has done and what Jesus can do. And there's something beautiful about a personal testimony. I want to share a story with you real quick, and then we're going to come to a close. Um, I share this story because, you know, sometimes we think that we don't have a testimony. And you know, I'll just be honest with you. I'll be very real. That's, that's really sad. That's really sad when I've heard people say that. I mean, I wish I had a power. But I'm not, I'm not picking on anybody. But, I've, but when I've heard somebody say, man, I wish I had a powerful testimony, my heart just breaks. You know, if you've ever thought that, I want to kindly and lovingly ask you to reconsider your life reconsider, reconsider of what, think back of what Jesus has done. Has he touched your heart and set you free from a life of sin? Is there anybody here that doesn't need that freedom? You know, if you have that testimony, friends, that's, that's, the, that's the most powerful testimony that a human being could have. And it's a testimony that can help change people, change people's lives, change people's minds. You know, there's people out there that want to argue about the Bible. People out there that want to argue whether God is real. But when you have a personal experience, they can't argue. It shuts people's mouths. Do you know that? It does. You know, I'll tell you, when I was canvassing, my second canvassing program, I'll I'll tell you, though, real quick, that I used to be, I'm still very bold. When it comes to the Bible, I'm I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I'm not ashamed of people knowing that I'm a Christian, and I'm not ashamed at all of where I've been and what Christ has led me from. I'm still very bold in the truth. But when I first began the canvas, sometimes I was a little too bold. (laughs) Just a little bit, okay? And so, but even sometimes when you're too bold, the Lord still blesses, because my heart was in it. So the story I'm gonna tell you, I'm I'm not saying I was too bold in this story, 
But anyways, the Lord's still blessed. So as I was canvassing, as I was canvassing in Raleigh, North Carolina, it was on Easter Sunday. Yeah, yeah, Raleigh, North Carolina. It was Easter Sunday. And I was canvassing along, having all these beautiful experiences. And I went to this one house, and as I went to this, knocked on this door, this nice-looking older gentleman opened the door. And I began canvassing him, and he said, what are you doing? Don't you know it's the Sabbath? It was Easter Sunday. I said, oh, I'm sorry, and I just kept telling him what I'm doing, told him that I'm, told him that I'm going to school to enter the ministry. And he said, that's really alarming to know that you're going to school to enter the ministry, and you don't even know what the Bible says. I was like, I was like, oh, well, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, don't you know Sunday's the Sabbath? You're not supposed to be doing any work on the Sabbath. He was just hammering me. You know, I just felt this holy boldness rise up in me. <laughs> and I said, I said, well, actually, we're not supposed to say that word in canvassing. But I said, well, actually, did you know that the Sabbath is actually Saturday? And the Antichrist beast changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday? And did you actually know that Sunday is the mark of the beast? <laughs> you know what he said? He said, oh, yeah, seven day of Venice, huh? Slammed door in my face. So I left his house. And I'm walking up the road. And as I'm walking up the road, um, I mean, I'm, a few, I'm, a, I'm a block down the road. And like, I see this guy with a handful of papers walking up the road. I know he's coming to get me. You know, and like he started walking, I started going, I said, sir, I just don't have time, man. That's what I told him. I said, I just don't have time for this, sir. He said, no, 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 just listen. Let's just talk for just a minute. This is what he said. So I said, okay, man, let's talk. <laughs> and he started telling me all this stuff about how the church is the Catholic church. He's a Catholic. Um, he had all this paperwork of how the church has the authority to change the Sabbath. And I was just listening very patiently telling me all these different things of how Peter was the first pope and all this stuff and all this, this and that. And I was listening very patiently. And I said, sir, I don't know everything about what you're saying. But what I do know, and I began sharing personal things in my life that God has set me free from. Personal things. I mean, man, I was, we were all bound and shackled by iniquity, but, but I feel like I really was. And I was telling him about it. And I said, sir, all that I know is that the God that I serve, the God of the Seventh-day Adventist church, has set me free. And that's what I do know. And you know what he said? He said, well, I can't argue with that. And you know what else? He got the GC from me. Yeah. And you know what else? He let me pray with him. Yeah. And it was beautiful. He could not argue with a personal testimony. You, you, you cannot do it. That's why God has given us this. He's given us this story, friends. God wants to touch our hearts. Deliver us. Deliver us from sin. Give us freedom. Like true freedom. Like where well, the world doesn't matter anymore. Where we don't have to worry about the things of this world anymore. Where like all things truly do become like brand new. Like a new life. Isn't that amazing that God wants to give that to us? And he wants us to share it with people. You know, the same thing happened Sunday. Me and Maboshi and Annette were canvassing. And I walked up this car and really nice. She looked like a 70 minutes or a Pentecostal lady. She was, had her hair up in a bun, long dress. She was in her car. And I began canvassing her and there was this young girl in the driver's seat and she was mugging me. Like she was like, just looked disgusted at me. I went to go give her the great, the great Controversy. She said, I don't need that. I said, whoa, okay. She said, I'm Pentecostal. We're the real church. And she started going off on me. This is, I'm telling you, this girl right here hammered me. She was hammering me. I'm going to hell. I don't, I don't have God. I don't have the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to mock these. I'm just telling you the real story of what, what has happened, okay? And as this girl is just hammering me, and I like try to say something very calm, very nice, you know, and she just, man, going off on me while I'm lost and I don't have Jesus. And 
I need to be speaking in tongues. And finally, finally she had to take a breath. And whenever she took a breath, I was, I was able to speak. <laughs> and I said, ma'am, listen, listen. I don't know about everything that you're saying. But what I do know, and I told her personal things that God had set me free from. I told her the God that I serve has done this for me, set, set me free from all these different things, and he's given me of his spirit. And so all I know is that this God that I serve is true, because she was telling me I wasn't a Christian and that I didn't have the spirit. And I told her all I know is his spirit is the one that has done this for me in my life. Entire face, everything changed. The whole conversation changed. She, could, she still tried to get me to come to the church, but she could not argue. She did not say I wasn't a Christian. She could not deny what I told her. And you know, it's not just because they got words. It's not just because I'm telling her things. Like her, her heart is convicted by the Holy Spirit when you are sharing what Jesus has done in your life. Christ is there through his Spirit, impressing hearts in a way that they can't deny. They know that's God. When you start sharing how God has delivered you, their heart, they know that this is Jesus. And you know, friends, as we close, God is seeking to give us this testimony. And I know most of you have this testimony, probably all of you, but if not, it's okay, because if you don't have that testimony, what do we learn from this story, friends? Come, cry, see your need, friends. You have got to see your need, that you are utterly helpless. Without you have no power to gain victory over sin without Jesus. It's impossible. Don't get caught in this, that, that trap of trying to save yourself, of trying to gain victory. It's not possible. When we see that condition, friends, we can cry out to God for help. When we cry out for God to help, he will help us, help us take our eyes off ourselves, direct them to Jesus, and then something beautiful happens. And then we have that testimony to share. So friends, what I want to encourage you, my, my appeal is this, friends. I want you to rethink about your life with Jesus. I'm not trying to say question your Christianity, but rethink of where God has led you, how God has set you free from your own mind, and share that with somebody, share that with people. And if you, have, if you don't have that testimony yet, the book Prayer, page 12, paragraph 4, it says prayer will bring you into immediate contact with the wellspring of life. Immediate contact. Be in the presence of Jesus. And friends, when you spend time on your knees in the presence of Jesus, you can't help but be set free. You can't. If you're on your knees and spending that time pleading with God for help, you, you can't help but be set free. And so that's my prayer, friends, that we can all have that experience. We all want that experience, right? Yeah. All right, let's pray, okay? <clears throat> Dear Lord, we want to thank you so much, Father, for speaking to our hearts, Lord. And we want to thank you so much, Lord, for giving us our own testimony, Lord. A powerful testimony. A testimony of how we were lost, bound and shackled by sin but how you touched us and set us free and gave us life. Father, I pray that we could all have that experience, Lord. I pray if there's people here that doubt their testimony, if there's people here that don't realize the power of the story that they have of their own life, Lord, I pray that you would bring those things to their mind and show them how you have been with them and that it's you that has set them free, Lord, so that they can share this with others. Father, I pray that tonight this message could... Um, just touch our hearts. I pray that it can be applied in our lives, and I pray that if we're, some of us are seeking to have that testimony, that we can remember that prayer brings us into immediate contact with the wellsprings of life. And Lord, we love you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.